And this is Art Viewing Adventures. Jeanette Pettibone and I are going to be talking about the Joan Brown exhibition at SF MoMA. Really excited about that. It is a blockbuster, I, I would say. But funny that that Jeanette, you are on the East Coast. I just came from the East Coast. <laughs> and I got to say, the museums on the East Coast are great museums, but SF MoMA has better bathrooms. Oh, by far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So oh my you know, God. <laughs> well, they might have they might have like you know incredible an incredible collection, but it isn't just about that. You know? Yeah, I mean the plain. Uh, their bathrooms are so plain and boring. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so so we're at one o'clock. Um, we'll start off with uh, Nikki Trasvina. You're going to tell us about what's going on at Community Living Campaign. Our our host organization. Okay, thank you so much. Nice to be here with you all. I was just checking over the calendar. So the Community Living Campaign is a nonprofit uh, dedicated to advocating to, uh, uh, on behalf of seniors and people with disabilities in San Francisco. We bring you lots of different types of programming. We have uh, dance and exercise programs online and in person. Um, and we have a lot of art stuff, which is really great. Um, something that you're used to us announcing for Monday is the um, Richie Un Un Unterberger events, but actually he's moving to Fridays, and his first Friday will be this week, Friday the 27th, and he's doing the animals. Who remembers the animals? I do. <laughs> uh, so, so remember now, it's moving from Monday to Fridays. That's very important. And then some other new programming has to do with film. One of our um, tech staff people is very big on film. She worked in the film industry and she's bringing a lot of her knowledge and um, you know just her love of film to CLC. And I think that's going to be really fun. So tomorrow at five, she's got uh, something about the history of the Alfred Hitchcock movie. So to me, that's so cool because that's local that's the birds and a lot of the things he did in the bay area so that should be fun and another big thing that clc does is we are really trying to bridge the gap in technology between seniors and people that are disabled and technology and make sure that everybody is up to speed on tech because you know if you're if we're not we're gonna we're gonna miss out you know i mean if you're a lawyer or you're a doctor or somebody says you know We've got to do this on Zoom. You've got to be comfortable with that. So if you know any individuals that need help with tech, we we do it either online, on the phone. Um, you know, we're that's one of our main foci right now. Anyway, I'm really excited to hear about Joan Brown at the MoMA. I want to get head over to the MoMA uh soon also and 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 see this exhibit, and I understand Esther Hernandez has something at the MoMA now, so I really want to go visit that as well. So Jeanette, thank you for being here, and Rodney, thank you for bringing all these great um, art critics to us. Great, so so thanks, Nikki. And yeah, Jeanette, you are a fellow um, museum guide. You, um, I know you do stuff for both the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and SF MoMA, as I, I do SF MoMA. Um, and you and I have had a lot of fun with these programs in the past, talking about exhibitions going together, which we got to do for this one. And we're going to um, take everyone through some of our favorite works at uh, the Joan Brown exhibition. Um, you may notice, by the way, a little bit of flickering. We're not quite sure why that's going on. So I'll just um, apologize, but hopefully that won't get in the way of us appreciating what we're going to be looking at. Um, and, and we're going to take turns kind of looking at these um, paintings from Joan Brown. We have we we could not limit ourselves to a reasonable number. So what we've decided to do is, um, I think we're going to do a part two discussion of this uh, later on. But Jeanette, why don't I, I'll start off by um, we'll start start off with this one. This is a work that you'll see right when you come off the elevator at SF MoMA. It's up on the um, seventh floor, and uh, this one. Um, well, Jeanette, let me ask you, what, what kind of um, <laughs> stood out to you looking at this image of um, this woman in a cat? Well, you have to, if anyone has owned a cat, 
<laughs> you probably um, picked up your cat at one time and those stiff, stiff legs. Um, you just know that cat isn't quite <laughs> in a snuggling mood there. And um, and I, I love that. I love also <laughs> for me, I, you know, this is probably overreaching a bit, but the, the um, like the tenderness of the face on face that yeah, I've seen a lot in, you know, Virgin with Child, like <laughs> the Virgin Mary and the Christ Child having that tender cheek to cheek moment. And I, um, which I am not at all <laughs> comparing this, just that that tenderness, this you can you can tell that her cat is part of the family is is one of the kids. And um, that's, that's just so much fun for me. Yeah, and we'll see, like, um, Joan Brown um, does make a big deal about her animals. Uh, and um, I think that's a great observation, Jeanette, about, like, the kind of cheek-to-cheek, -cheek, um, very tender moment, even though the cat isn't quite into it. I know. <laughs> we, we, we in our family, um, my sister-in-law has a cat that's, that's very much like this, that you would really want to think twice about picking up. Um, but the wall text for this one is pretty fun. Um, so the cat's name is Donald. And uh, it, it apparently Joan Brown, um, when she did her taxes, um, she she uh, took a deduction for Donald because he had been a subject of her painting and she was challenged by the IRS and she won. She got to keep um, she got to deduct his uh, his veterinary costs and his cat food. And, and it, it, he became known as Donald the deductible. <laughs> So I providing love that. essential modeling services <laughs> and then I, I just love like this background that she has um you know in this portrait of her it's very you know these things we'll see are very personal there's emotion she's really revealing herself in in a way i think few artists do with many of her self-portraits yeah i i do love that it feels like all of her paintings are personal everything is personal it's and in in a way that is such a wonderful glimpse into her life and her personality and her ever changing interests and you, you sort of know off the bat she's a little bit feisty <laughs> yeah and we do i do feel like we get to know her in this exhibition yeah. so let's move on to this is an early painting um Jeanette why, why don't you take the lead on this one yeah, so I absolutely love this one. Um, uh, this is a, a lot of this you're going to see. Um, we'll get to some details. Um, kind of exemplifies a lot of her earlier work, which, you know, considering we just started with Joan and Donald um, and that those colors and and that style, you can tell that she's changed her styles quite a bit through her painting career. Um, so one thing I like to I, I'd like to pose to all of you, whether you can put a, a chat in a comment in the chat or just think about it, is when you see this, the girls in the surf with moon casting a shadow, imagine yourself there in, in this painting. What what does it feel like? For me, I get a very big sense of. Of, of a feeling of being there um, in this painting. There's a very special mood, I think, that gets captured uh, with the paint, uh, not just the colors, but also sort of the thicknesses of the paint. I don't know, do you do you want to share any sort of mood you get, Rodney? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's intriguing that, you know, they're, they're going into the water um, in the darkness, um, but there's, you know, they're holding hands, so they're, um, there's a kinship, and uh, it just seems like they don't seem to be afraid yeah. of, of this, this experience, you know, like they've, uh, they kind of done it before, um, I'm going to just, you know, knowing it's Joan Brown, and knowing our Bay Area, um, I imagine the water's pretty cold, <laughs> since they're not even wearing wetsuits or really not wearing anything. Yeah. <laughs> they don't seem bothered by that. Yeah, I, I know. They're just sort of looking, um, 
one's looking away, one sort of looking straight ahead and walking into the void almost, this black, black, blackness of the background. And I imagine the blue as being waves splashing around them and that it's cold. And for anyone who has looked at a lot of paintings of of women bathing, <laughs> of bathers and women nudes uh, by water, bathing in water. This has such a different feel for me. Um, there, there, it's it's leaving behind any sort of uh, overt eroticism. Um, it just seems like friends who decided to go skinny dipping or, you know, and they're just walking into this for an experience and the cold and the dark and the way that the yellow there kind of captures the light of the moon just really excites me. Yeah. Joan says, I sense cold in the depiction of their bodies. Yeah. Definitely picked up on that. Great. I think it's interesting for you to take note that it's a woman um, showing women nudes and um that that's that that's going to give us a different feel yeah um other thoughts out there folks um you're, you're welcome to either unmute or um or throw something in the chat we're, we're eager to hear um I, hopefully many of you have seen this exhibition it's on view i believe through march 12th at sf moma not to be missed and um and also, I'll just mention, um, you know, we had the David Park exhibition about a, what, a year, year and a half ago at SF MoMA, um, Bay Area figurative uh, painter. And, and this is kind of reminding me a lot of some of the, um, he had a lot of nude bathers also. Yeah. And yeah, and uses some of the sort of um, care, the the way the, the the figures are drawn, I think also reminds me a lot and and the colors and the paint. I think you have a detail of how thick the paint is too. I do. Um, I just want to note, Karen okay. notes the house on the hill in the background. Like, that's interesting. I, I didn't realize that that it, that is probably what that is. It's like, <laughs> it makes you wonder where this would be. Maybe this would be like China Beach or someplace like that. But yeah, here's here's some detail of the paint. Um, um, and, and this is a good example of what we can't do on Zoom. Like you do get a sense of the paint here, but it's also, we highly recommend you go see the painting for yourself. Yeah. And you'll, you'll and appreciate if, you know, how thick this paint is. Of course, we do the best to try and if you can't make it to bring this to you. And I think here you can see that this is not a flat surface, that there are layers upon layers upon layers of paint here. And in all of her early period, she uses all this paint. And I even, I read something about one time she had an exhibition of a painting she'd done the year before. So it was about a year old and the paint was still wet enough that it was dripping and creating little pools <laughs> underneath where it was hung. And she was, she was like, oh, that's great. <laughs> I like that. That adds a new, a new dimension, a new thing. So, um, so here, you know, this, this here is a detail of that blue that's on the sides that almost feel like it's surrounding the women. Probably just because it's blue, I, I think of it as sort of waves crashing in on them um, in the painting. But also, you know, it sort of creates a structure for the painting by having the blue on both sides there, framing the two women. Um, and this thick, thick paint is something that is so uh, part of her style of her early years of painting. Yeah, it makes me think of the another uh, woman artist of that time, Jay DeFeo, who who made incredibly thick, uh, thickly painted paintings. I got to see one of them um, on, on this trip at the Whitney, the Rose, which was so, um, it was like 
almost more than a thousand pounds yeah. and had to be removed from her home using a forklift and re removing like a window. Yeah. Crazy. That's, it, it's so, I, I think that they knew each other and they were even friends. They were painting about the same time period and both are San Francisco were were painting most of or at least their early career in San Francisco and they must have been very lucrative customers uh <laughs> for the whatever art supply store they went to yeah really <laughs> so we'll move on um so Noel and Bob 1964 there's a lot of paintings Joan Brown did that shows her domestic life so and, I'm gonna ask you because yeah. um so this, for me, Noel and Bob was one of the first Joan Brown paintings I saw. Um, it, it, hang, it was hanging at the De Young Museum here in San Francisco, and it was my first introduction, and I was really excited about it. And I, I'd love to hear, Rodney, um, where, because I, I often think about this, where do you think they are? here where do you think Noel and Bob are what what sort of clues do you get or well, ideas that's, that's or a great feelings? question he's barefoot that tells you something right yeah. he's so he could be outside but I, yeah. I wouldn't think he is uh and Bob looks like he's maybe hungry he's look like getting ready for <laughs> dinner to be be set down so I'm going to say it's probably somewhere in the house uh it's probably uh you know some place there jo Joan Brown is trying to both be a mom and be a painter at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he's pointing at Bob, maybe saying, hey, mom, you know, Bob's ready for dinner. <laughs> You're kind of busy, I know, but um, so so there's that going on. And yeah, I, um, I love that finger that you pointed out. It's um, it seems so normal for um a young kid like that who's pointing at everything <laughs> to have that point uh the pointing at the dog yeah I've so, always yeah go ahead so I guess I'll guess, I'll, I'll guess it's like in her studio which is also part of her house and, and so is that what you think Jeanette well, for some reason, and I don't know why, maybe I heard from somewhere and I forgot, or for some reason, I have always thought it's the beach, <laughs> yeah, me but I don't too. know why I think that. And maybe someone actually knows, um, but when I look at all of the red, the red on the, the sky and the red on most of the right side around um bob but then on the left side there's the sort of sand color and the blue that could be ocean or sky i don't know does someone have um another idea or well, I no see, i see sherry is saying it reminds me of beach in a campfire <laughs> okay um all that paint gives us movement. I think that's about the last one from Joan. Looks like he's on a rock with a tree behind. Oh, yeah. So it's a good example of how different people see things in different ways. And I probably project a bit on um, the domestic stuff. It, you know, I think uh, Joan Brown was born about the same time as my mother. Uh -huh. And Noel was born, um, I think, maybe a year or two before me. And so it makes me think of my, you know, my mother was also trying to um, have a career and be a mom at the same time. So I'm yeah. always thinking about that when I see these pictures. Yeah. I One thing I really like is sometimes I don't know what Joan Brown is thinking <laughs> at all. Like, I, I there are sometimes clues. Um, and I know that she said that, she uh, doesn't mind people interpreting things the way they see them. Uh, so, uh, but I, I particularly like this one. I think it, because it was my first introduction to Joan Brown, um, I like the colors. I like the paint. It's just it, luscious. <laughs> I think I read somewhere a critic saying something about Joan Brown's love of paint using words something like she wallows in the colors and 
and it, it be, it's so easy for the spectator to become infected by this enthusiasm and just it, it, love it because of this lusciousness and physicality of all that paint and all these colors that there's yeah, just very, like- very striking. Yeah. Um, comment from Joan. She says, uh, I see a cat behind Noel's head in a rat to the right. So maybe ah. that's the rat and this, would that be the cat or is, is this the cat? Tell, tell us if we're getting that right, Joan. <laughs> Up on top. On top. Okay, this is a cat. The blue going into a yellow head. And, okay. and those are two of her signature motifs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of cats and there's quite a few rats in dogs. Cat and rat. Perfect, yeah. And other, other animals. Um, we do have some pictures of the actual subjects. There's, there's Bob <laughs> with Joan. And um, yeah. Bob is a bull terrier, right? Oh, is that right? If you are, if you know dogs, <laughs> yeah. And again, apologies for these flickers. I'm we aren't yeah. sure why that's happening. And then I found this picture of Noel Neary, who um, he is. He became a sculptor like his father, Manuel Neary. And uh, you know, he I would love to know how he feels when he sees these paintings you know, to be immortalized like that. Yeah. Uh, another, we, we, I mentioned David Park before, and this again reminds me of um, David Park, who would certainly have been an influence on her. Yeah, he's, if you haven't seen David Park, they, it, it, they're they both, well, David Park's a Bay Area figurative artist. I think there's been debate whether Joan Brown quite fits in, that she might've started out learning from a lot of the Bay Area figurative artists um, and then, but doesn't quite fit into that categorization um, though is strongly associated with it. Um, but if you don't know the Bay Area figurative artists, don't worry about it. It's just a, a sort of a group of artists at this time period in the Bay Area that went against the abstract expressionist movement that was going on in New York and um, were painting. You know, we often stay away from the isms and, yeah. and all, you know, getting yeah. into the, all that, but it's still good to know, like, what kind of company yeah. were they keeping and what, what was her place in all that? And yeah. I think this show really makes the argument that she established a very unique um, style. Like, she wasn't, she wasn't like, you couldn't really group her with other people, but it's cool to know who the influences on her might have been. Um, let's move on to um, our next work. Um, I'll, you'll take the lead on this, Jeanette, although I'm the one who picked it. What, what do you think? <laughs> what, are you, what are your thoughts on this image? Well, I would, I, because you did pick it, I'd love to hear you talk about this one um, and, and why you chose to <laughs> include this. Well, it, it delighted me when I realized that this was the... Um, um, the carriage entrance to the uh, War Memorial Opera House. I, I go to the opera. I'm a big um, fan of it. And I've spent a lot of time there. And I know this location quite well. And I think it's really so, so many things going on in this painting. You know, she's with her husband. She, this is, I believe, her third husband. Um, she had four. And, you know, he's dressed formally. She's um, staying next to him like they're, you know, looking like you, you know, well-dressed for the opera, but they're there with their dog. <laughs> and the dog is in, in a separate panel. It's a diptych. And he's just kind of looking at them. And, you know, I don't know, what do you, like, <laughs> would you, Jeanette, if the dog could talk, what, what do you think the dog would be saying right now? Well, it's so interesting that the dog also seems to be very formal in in his pose. Um, you can see there's one paw that's up and sort of horizontal and one paw down and it gives it, you know, sort of like he's performing a trick or doing something very formal or maybe asking for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the dog happens to be, it is, um, a dog that they owned, it happens to be black and white, which kind of meshes with the tuxedo and the, the formal garb. Um, but yeah, wh why is the dog along 
along for the opera. Yeah, because um, you don't see too many dogs at the opera. That even, even service animals don't really make it in the house. <laughs> but I love, I love that they've now. Rufus has his own panel, <laughs> um, and but I love that they've included Rufus and put him up on the railing there, kind of to give him the height. He's not, he's not by their feet. He's not um, that typical dog by your feet. He's sort of up high, elevated, and has what looks like here a fabulous collar. Maybe yeah, yeah. Very, as formally dressed as you're going to be as a dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, another detail that intrigued me were the clouds in the blue sky in the background. And it did make me think of Magritte because Magritte's that's like his trademark. Um, I wonder if Joan Brown is kind of nodding to him. Is there there's some surrealism going on here? This is, you know, we've she's taken the scene. Um, a little bit out of its context, you know, we we see like the um, sky in the background here. That's not where you would, this is where you would be seeing Fulton Street coming in. It looks nothing like this, right? <laughs> so it's it's kind of this idealized or, or you know, image of, um, of the time she's going to the opera. I also like to think about their relationship, um, considering the way that they're posed here. Um, you know, she has her hand in his arm, but then look at where he has his hands. It feels like that position is, is sort of a closed off position. Um, you know, he's not open. He's, he's got his hands together and down and is sort of a closed off position there. Um, not really touching her at all. She's, She's got her arm on her hand in his arm, but um, he it seems like you could just take the hand away and he stands on his own. And, and that was an interesting dynamic, it seemed to me, to to paint here. Yeah, he's kind of stiffly posed, um, kind of reminds me a little bit of the Frida and Diego painting that SF. Oh, right, right. Yes. Yeah. You no, know, to see like a couple together, but. Um, you might get the sense maybe not all as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that it, this marriage did not last forever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's. Um, and I think this is actually this is the image they're using to publicize the show. I believe. Okay. Uh, is that right? Or no? Maybe that's me. Maybe that's I use this image to publicize this show. You, yeah, <laughs> you definitely did. It's just me. Um, uh, Sherry <laughs> notes the dog. It looks like the dog is wearing pearl a pearl collar necklace. Yeah. Uh, class classed up doggy there. Yeah. And I like that the you know Rufus has his tongue out <laughs> and the red of Rufus, Rufus's tongue and then the red um of the the pearl collar and then the red stripes of yeah. the, yeah. the pathway kind of um give us this this um sort of through note of red that's really interesting yep yep she's she is just great with her palettes yeah the colors all right we'll move on to the bride and i know Jeanette, you wanted to take the lead on this one. Oh, this is just such a wonderful painting. One thing that you never get uh, on Zoom is the size of it either, that it's, um, I believe it's about seven and a half feet tall. So this is a larger than life painting of a bride called the bride, but immediately you notice, yes, there's the, the wedding dress, the bridal gown, um, the bouquet, but who is this? <laughs> uh, we have a cat face on the head um, and all of these wonderful uh, images and animals and flowers and symbols going on here. And so the first thing I did, you know, the whimsy, you were talking about Magritte and the surrealism and the the also I think this brings out a lot of how she has such a great sense of humor um she has a little whimsy 
And I think she likes to activate our curiosity as a viewer. So it's hard to just look and then look away. <laughs> and um, you, you want to look for a little bit longer. What, what's really going on here? Is a cat getting married? <laughs> is, what is the relationship for the cat and the rat? Um, I think there's a question in the comments. Is the rat the groom? <laughs> um, and it looks quite possibly like that. Um, it's that we ask ourselves what these questions are, these questions about this piece that I think is something that makes it particularly exciting. Yeah, there's a lot of there's animal symbolism. Yeah, uh, the flowers are interesting. There's um, those are po those orange ones seem to me to be poppies. Yeah, the uh, orange yeah. and the red are poppies. Um, and then there's white and um, blue ones, which are morning glories, I think. I think that's what I read about them. And um, just absolutely wonderful. And they're on this black field. So here, obviously, we get a lot of the symbolism. Um, the rat, we saw the rat before, and as Joan brought up, that rats and cats are often in her work as well as fish um, as we have here in the background uh, we've got flowers and I like to think so the bride we've seen in another painting a self-portrait of hers where she puts lots of symbols she has the same bridal gown and the same pose with her face on it so I think I put a slide in there just to show you, um, but we, th yeah, so in this, uh, that's pretty much the same pose, the same gown, and that's her face there and the self-portrait of all these symbols of her. So we really are thinking that this is her as a bride, but taking on a persona, which she'll take on over and over and over again through her paintings, that of a cat. Um, and. And just uh, another question to pose, why do you think someone would have a cat as an alter ego? What do you think that would tell you about Joan Brown? Or what do you think it means about Joan Brown that she would, she has this alter ego of a cat? Um, uh, just, I, I would, I mean, for one thing, I would imagine she enjoys naps. <laughs> <laughs> She's kind of fastidious. Yeah. Um, she does not like to be um, bothered, maybe, you know, <laughs> there's some cat like attributes kind of um, a cat is a solitary animal. You know, cats are, are very self-contained. So you wonder if that's part of it. Yeah. Independent. I, I see in the chat. Um, and then when, when you think about tying cats to spirituality, I think she liked Egypt. And so Egypt had a special relationship with cats and worshiping cats, but then I think about us and Halloween <laughs> and how we we sometimes put cats on the dark side, um, the the witchy side <laughs> at least uh, for Halloween. Um, so there's a lot I like I like to think about. You, you know, if you were to choose an alter ego animal, what would you choose? And and how would you represent that? Because here she's also got a, a bridal <laughs> gown. This is a wedding. <laughs> and then but, is, yeah, go ahead. Well, that's a good question, Jeanette. I'm trying to think what my my animal <laughs> alter ego would be. Um, might be a pelican. I, 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 I don't oh, know. Nice. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm an adventurer and I like... Uh, being able to roam he, he, near and far. <laughs> nice. Oh, and here we have some other comments. A cat has many lives. She, <laughs> she did have many weddings. <laughs> yeah, I think if cats could get married, they probably would have like, yeah, probably multiple. Yeah. And I think, and, and Joan, Joan ties in, yeah, in her role as Bastet, the pleasure loving Egyptian goddess fond of music and dancing and she and and Joan Brown definitely fond of music and dancing and I love the the pleasure loving Egyptian goddess yeah absolutely thanks I mean, Joan and clearly there's this symbolism here yeah 
Uh, and one could probably read scholarly pieces about Joan Brown and see what they say. And I'll be honest, I haven't done that. I, I <laughs> like doing it on my own. I like I like this idea that um, the artists has put their um, images out there for us to interpret on our own. Yeah. And um, I don't think you, in my opinion, you need to do a lot of study to be able to go deep on these things. Yeah, you, there's no reason to study art history. You you know what you're seeing and, and what's happening. Uh, yeah, so one thing, I don't know if we have, uh, I think we, you do have a close-up slide. Um, the next one, maybe. The rat. Have this rat. <laughs> so what is the rat? What is so exciting here is uh, that the rat is outlined in glitter. Um, and that rat fur just really looks furry. And the rat, the size comparison between the bride and the rat, that is an enormous rat. I love, um, <laughs> it's it, and it's on a leash. So. Uh, Hence the uh, belief it could be the husband. Yeah, absolutely. It could be the groom. <laughs> you have a bride here, right? <laughs> and, um, but I, I really like this glitter because, if you think about how thick and luscious that painting that we just saw um, uh, a few paintings ago, the girls in the surf and Nolan Bob, the thickness of the paint and the, the sort of lusciousness. And here the paint is much flatter, but we're still getting something exciting and textural and um, interesting, adding this glitter and and giving us something more than just paint, in, in which I think is just something that is really beautiful about uh, the way she seems to love the act of painting as well as the final product and the symbolism. And she's not wedded to one particular uh, material. She'll, yeah. she'll try lots of different materials. Yeah. Um, Marsha says, I think she is characterizing her, I'm not reading that word, uh, outro, I don't know what that is, um, of her rat spouse. Notice she ignores all the fish about. Are they <laughs> represent other men? There's other fish in the sea. Oh, yeah, I like that. Some pretty cool ones, too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So, yeah. Um, in we had a great, we yeah. spent a fair amount of time in the gallery on this one. And, uh. I think I think you'll find it pretty captivating. Yeah. So um, self-portrait with scarf drinking tea. There's a lot of self-portraits um, in it, and um, it's just kind of interesting. Um, Jeanette, you you really wanted us to include this one. What are some of the things that really drew you into this image? I love that she gave a self-portrait where we really only see her eyes. Um, it's mostly her eyes, <laughs> her, we get the top of her nose, but she's covering her nose and her mouth with this cup of tea. And also I was just thinking about how, I think I relate to this more in the last few years where so many of us are wearing masks and all we see of each other is our eyes sort of from that nose up too. And so I, I wonder if subconsciously when I first saw this, I was really responding to the times we live in with that. Um, and, and there's just something I really, the scarf, it, it feels sort of glamorous. It reminds me of other paintings I've saw, seen with uh, women drinking coffee or tea that I've really enjoyed and resonate with me. But I think mostly it's that we remove everything about the face except those eyes, and they're looking a little, a little tired, maybe. Or I don't. Well, I don't know. What do you think? Uh, how do you think she's feeling right now, Rodney? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Like, yeah, she is this. I mean, I certainly wouldn't say this is a happy image. <laughs> you know, she's kind of. Um, you know, she's masked herself. Something's going on there behind that that teacup, and she's kind of covered her hair. So again, she is kind of like self-contained and maybe maybe just like contemplating her life 
And, um, you know, I think she did have a tumultuous life. Um, she's trying to be a mother and raise Noel, um, but her marriages are not going well. And so is this a woman who's kind of contemplating all that? Yeah. Um, I do love the, the 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 you know the the roundness of the scarf around her head. I see this blue line here. I can't help but think of Tebow when I see that because he loves yeah, yeah. those blue lines. And you know, I think she's like drawing in influences from other artists around her, but you know, doing it with her own style. And it's Can a marvelous palette once again. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly that, and I love that yellow and the pink and yeah it's just it's just wonderful and, and might we also mention cindy sherman who um you know cindy sherman does it with photography but here we're seeing all these different views of joan brown again she's her own subject um uh, in, in just like all these different really different narratives you can pull from these images yeah. yeah she's she's putting on a new persona you know um and and we're about to see with the next self portrait from the exact same year. So this is the same year uh, a, a, a self portrait. She doing something that to me seems completely different. What sort of feeling do you get from this one, Rodney? Well, I can't see this without like there's humor in it, right? It's um, I love the uh, checked background and how it um, picks up the colors of this uh, this fur hat, this crazy fur hat that almost could be a wig. And, you know, again, you just look at her and you think, well, who is this woman? You know, it's, a, it's and, and she looks kind of like a deer in a caught in the headlights. She's um, kind of, uh, you know, like she's kind of holding it back, but you look, she doesn't look happy. She looks <laughs> kind of, uh, um, caught in a moment I guess something's going on there yeah it's so uh, interesting um Marcia made a comment look um that the eyes in that last one were indecipherable and they're so different than the eyes in this one you were saying Rodney like a um, deer yeah. in headlights there's just they're so seem so wide open instead of this half <laughs> half opened and indecipherable um but i i'm not exactly sure that this one's decipherable <laughs> either can we can we know exactly what she's thinking um it's it, it's really i love the the contrast of these oh a good question is what size is this um i'd say it's about three feet by two and a half something like that that's it's gonna be I guess it's pretty pretty fair fairly big and the the one drinking tea is a little bit smaller than that yeah yeah we do have i think we have them side by side although yeah. this is not going to be to scale right it's not to scale um yeah and i love i love also you mentioned the check background which i love and the fur hat it matches the colors I also like in this one that she has paint all over her shirt. <laughs> mm -hmm. So she's really depicting herself as an artist uh, because she's got this paint all over. This is her as painter. And so that's great. You don't really quite get that in the tea drinking where she feels she feels more hidden. And in this one, I feel like she's wide open. Her eyes are wide open. And she's letting you see a little bit more, but she's still got this great hat. <laughs> uh, she also looks, I mean, she looks young. She looks like she's ready to go out and party, maybe after a hard day of painting. You know, I think I think it's a, um, uh, you know, like I'd, I would definitely want to talk to her, the, the right. So the one on the left, I'd probably leave her alone. But the one on the right, I'd want to chat her up, see what she has yeah. to say. And um, Julianne says that the checkered background gives a punk aesthetic. Yeah, I um, totally see that. Totally. I get that. And with the the hat, the whole thing definitely gives a punk aesthetic. Um, Karen says that the stitching on the shirt is a great detail, an interesting detail. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, Miriam says, although this was during the hippie hate Ashbury era. Um, so... Okay, maybe <laughs> not, yeah, not she, quite. 
she they could definitely bring her up and she could be playing with the talking heads or something you know? yeah <laughs> yeah i totally i see the the new age uh, or the new wave um music uh but also remember these two paintings were done in the same year and i feel like they have very different aesthetics um so that's also really fun and really great that she's playing with aesthetics whether or not they were the predominant one of the era so uh, yeah interesting comment from sharon that her yeah. hair color varies in these self-portraits sometimes she's dirty blonde sometimes she's got like red hair so again uh, the cindy sherman thing where she's kind of reinventing herself yeah. for these different ways um she's portrayed herself i think she's probably playing with her hair color in in real life, not just in her paint. I, I I have that feeling really great. Yeah. Sorry, accidentally hit the next one, but let's, <laughs> let's move on to the next one because that's um there's some this is part of an interesting series that's from a few years later. Jeanette, why don't you take the lead on this one? Okay. So um this is called uh, The Night Before the Alcatraz Swim. And just to give a little bit of background, since here we are in the Bay Area, we probably have heard of the Alcatraz Swim. Maybe some of you even have done the Alcatraz Swim. If you have, definitely shout out. <laughs> um, but it, if you don't know of it, it's a swim from Alcatraz to the aquatic park in San Francisco. I think it's about one and a half miles um, and you, as you can imagine, the waters can be quite rough. She was a lifelong swimmer and um, open water swimmer. So she was swimming in aquatic park and went, and she actually uh, did the swim. Uh, was it in 1975 or 1974? She did the swim and painted a, a series of paintings about her experience. Um, kind of tangentially about her experience and also remember everything she paints is personal. So uh, just uh, given that background, here we have the night before the Alcatraz swim. Uh, what sort of mood and feeling do you get in this one? Uh, I, I will, first of all, I'll invite people to chime in. I, yeah. I, know, I know a little bit about it. I'm going to be a little biased but yeah. you know one thing that really intrigues me is the um that she makes the water purple like this purple glow in the background it does evoke night but it also makes you think like okay this is um you know, it's a, I guess another surreal kind of uh um tone to it and then her, the look on her face she she looks like she's not so sure that she should be doing this Oh, uh, you know, am I going to really, how am I going to do like um, going from the, the rock um, swimming back to San Francisco through these treacherous waters? I think another interesting touch is these, um, the knots on the wood. Yeah. Kind of make you think of like swirling eddies that might be in the water. You yeah. Know? So I think she's, I think she's, it's, uh, she's concerned about um, <laughs> doing this swim as well. She should. And uh, a, 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 another note, uh, yeah, absolutely, the purple brings this really interesting uh, feeling to it. Um, but I, I all it's got the blue floor, and I believe that this isn't this is not supposed to be a window. This is her sitting in front of a painting, I believe, of Alcatraz. But there's some ambiguity here. I'm not really entirely sure if we're supposed to um, be in a in a space looking out through the window onto Alcatraz at night in the purple hues, or if she's sitting in front of a painting, which is would be either way a very calm. You see no waves in this picture of Alcatraz, and even though I think you're picking up on this not being quite so sure about going, but yet we see no outward um, any, any indication that the the waves or the 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 um, water is going to be choppy or or dangerous, except maybe you know these eddy like knots <laughs> in the way. Yeah. Um, comment from uh, 
Julianne, if I'm hopefully I'm saying that right, right. She says, purple for me evokes the mystery of what will happen the next day. Yet she is resolute, almost dreaming of what the swim might be like. She's on the blue floor. She's already in the water mentally. Oh, that's nice. That is <laughs> yeah. In the contrast of these colors, like the yellow shoes, the blue floor, the purple. Um, yeah. And then, and then uh, um, this checked, the checked pants and then this, um, you know, the, all these different um, uh, shapes, patterns. Um, you and I, I think, Jeanette, when we were walking through, we, we started thinking about Peter Max, the artist, and, and like how that, like, she's kind of checking some of his, his uh, stylistic choices. Yeah. Uh, one more comment to read, Peter and Kevin. Um, the knots all look like eyes looking at her. That's, that's so that's like also, that. you know, both of you either all these eyes looking at you or Eddie's that that there's a disquieting <laughs> image that can be brought up with all of the these. Yeah, and then Karen says the checks and striped pants are such a contrast. Yeah. Yet it works. You know, it's what it's what your my mom definitely told me you would you don't never leave the house dressed like that. But <laughs> I <yeah>. like it. <laughs> the pine paneling is very retro. Yep, that was a popular thing in the 70s. Uh the knots resemble yin and yang. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. And that would be calming potentially well one half is maybe calming and the other half isn't yeah because this is the before picture yeah this is the after okay. picture there you go what you um so Jeanette <laughs> you were you were commenting you commented on a couple things in the last one about how this could be read as either a window or a painting so what has she done here here she gave it a little bit of a shadow which makes it look like it's a painting so there the ambiguity is gone though it's interesting that there are shadows on both sides <laughs> of the painting sort of or a little like uh oh, yeah. the, the shadow imaging so i'm not really sure where the light is coming from but the way it's set up here it's it looks most definitely like it's a painting and not a window yeah, it's clearly a painting. Yeah. It's, yes, it's a painting that, um, you know, it evokes a very realistic scene, um, a tumultuous scene. We've got these big waves. Um, we've got these these little boats bobbing in the water. And then yeah. uh, she's got the dress with the um, the giant boat on it. And we'll, 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 well, this will be a spoiler, spoiler alert. If you don't really want to know the whole story, um, maybe you want to skip the next uh, minute or so, <laughs> but but the story is that on her swim from Alcatraz, uh, a, a giant container ship came by and she nearly drowned and had to be rescued. So it was quite, quite a, a difficult experience for her. Yeah. This is how she kind of documents that. And um, yeah, I think... It quite I think some something like 16 people had to be rescued what I it, it's hard to tell in a slide like this but you can you can see the boats the rescue boats pulling people out of the water and the big waves and there's even one boat yeah <laughs> over here where there are two boats and a, a person being rescued and pulled on both sides so this is sort of yeah the one where your cursor is there's one boat here and then just to the left of that, you see the blue of a bathing suit and another boat. And one boat has the woman's arms and the other boat has the woman's legs. Yes. And I was like, oh, the rescue even itself even sounds a little bit scary. <laughs> but it's also, I think it's also some humor to it, even though yeah. this is like a very scary experience. Um, I think I think she's kind of dealing with it with, with humor. Yeah, you and I we were intrigued by the phone because the phone has a number on it, which is like, I think it's three three seven three seven three seven. Yep. What did we decide on that? That that uh, that's how old she was. She well, she was thirty seven. Um, and then I think we backtracked and traced it, and that she was indeed thirty seven when she did this swim, and um, that was our guess. Our um. Uh, if anyone knows differently, <laughs> let us know. But our guess was that was her age. Yeah. 
It's so interesting also. So we have the phone on the red table, but the table doesn't really end if you look to, to the right. Um, the table just sorts of blends in, or at least maybe its legs are hidden, but would they be hidden behind the orange chair? There's, uh, again, some of this, mm, where are we in space that we saw in some of her earlier paintings. That's again. I get, I, it takes me back to surrealism. That she she doesn't care. She doesn't mind. She doesn't mind that there's shadows on both sides of the painting. She doesn't mind that the legs are missing. She she just thinks, oh, you know what? That's okay. They'll they'll be able to deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> and in the comments, Roger says maybe the water is what she's thinking or remembering. Absolutely, <laughs> it seems uh, very much like that's her experience. She's remembering. Um, and Max says the rescue is shown with people being pulled out of the water um, and love the yellow high heels. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I love them, too. I think she had them. Did she also have the yellow high heels in the previous? Yep. Yeah. Well, they're clogs. Well, they're they look, clogs. Yeah, they look. <laughs> she's gone from clogs to high heels. Um, yeah, they're again, the 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 it's almost like that yellow scarf against the pink background that yellow pink combination that we saw in her self-portrait i love the pop i love the yellow um and then we have butterflies on the carpet um she likes symbols so we can think what are some meanings of of butterflies um metamorphosis or 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 change. Um, I don't know if anyone has other ideas about uh, butterflies and and that, but you can imagine having a really scary experience um, could could <laughs> could create some changes in your life. Uh, well, what about the expression on her face, Jeanette? What do we make of that? Because she doesn't look. She yep. looks kind of like oh, you know, kind blank. of yeah, blank. <laughs> I, I feel, for me, I feel like it, it's kind of, um, I think what Roger was saying, the, the painting is what she's thinking or remembering. And I almost feel like all of her emotion got sucked out of her and her expression in her face and got sucked into the painting. So all of the trauma and all of that is going on in the painting. Um, and so, we have this complete contrast between the calmness of her face and her composure. She's sitting very straight. She's, uh, I get almost no sense of movement here. Her legs are crossed, but she's just, she's sitting there and all, everything, all the psyche <laughs> is captured in the painting. Yep. Um, just one side note I'll mention, she was, was doing all the swimming as part of a swim club in the Bay, and that swim club was um, was restricted, uh, it was only men, and she was among a small group of women who, who changed that. Um, yeah. Not something she really calls attention to in her paintings, but I think notable, nevertheless. Okay, we only have time for one more image, Jeanette, but we've already agreed we're going to do a part two because this is yeah. just such a great exhibition. So um, Dancers in a City, tell us, um, Jeanette, like what, what draws you into this painting? Well, I, first, I want to tie it also first to a comment that Joan made about the cat and um, the pleasure-loving Egyptian goddess that uh, enjoys music and dancing. And here we have both music and dancing and a series here. Um, of course, <laughs> I, I don't think you can miss noticing that the, the man is just an outline <laughs> here. Why do you think that might be, Rodney, that, the, that she's spent her attention on the woman and, and we've got this man as an outline? What how does that? Yeah, I, you know, you think maybe he's, um, this is like a sign that the marriage isn't going well, <laughs> that, um, you know, he's not really there. He's not yeah. really present. Yeah. Yeah. And I, she, I, she does this great detail with the dress. Of, um, she talks, there's a video in the gallery where she talks about this, that she was trying to paint the dress and she just wasn't happy with how it was turning out. So she just took the fabric 
of the dress and cut it out. And in, in, in the painting, it's actually fabric. And we've got those yellow high heels again. There we go. <laughs> Even though this is from a few years before. So those were obviously prized um, shoes in yeah. her collection. But um, yeah, I, I love that she uses in the actual textile and the dress here. Um, again, you know, she was using that thick, thick paint and then she was using glitter and and other things and now she's using fabric and that she's just going to create the work that she wants using whatever materials she wants however she wants to create it and not really pay attention to um anyone's else's thoughts about it she just is basically doing what she wants as as an artist and I love it. I think that the texture that comes from the dress or the glitter or the thick, thick paint brings an additional interest into all of her work and that that can be a theme throughout all of these really different styles of paintings that she has is, is that, um, that bringing that sort of pleasure of materials into it. Yeah. Um, we have a couple comments. Uh, Julianne says the male companion is not really there, but the canine companion is fully present. <laughs> That's true, right? Very, uh, even though the dog is nameless, as Paul Ann um, uh, points out, he's still a very, very prominent part of this painting. Um, and then that's probably the more detail complete on, on the dog's face than on the woman's or the man's. <laughs> right, the dog yeah. is really emoting there. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, it's 1972, but it's kind of, I kind of think it's cool that the Transamerica Pyramid is in the painting. And at a time when it was not a universally loved structure, um, the way I think it's become kind of iconic to San Francisco, but she includes it in the dancers in a city, but we know not just any city, it's our city. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. So we are um, just a little bit past two o'clock. Um, so we, as I said, Jeanette, we're, we're going to have you back in March and we'll do a part two and keep talking about this. Um, but Jeanette, any last thoughts on the Joan Brown exhibition at SF MoMA? It's, it's so wonderful and so much fun. You can take a journey with her as a painter, see what has inspired her, influenced her, changed. You go through the eras, you go through everything. Um, bring your curiosity, bring your sense of humor, be prepared to laugh with her um, and, and just really enjoy every moment of it. Yeah, and I would add to that, it's a great idea to go with a friend, um, discuss the paintings, um, argue you know you don't have to agree on on the interpretations yeah. you, you um have of this it's a really fun one um and june brown is just one of the great treasures of the bay area i, I you know I, I had a great trip to the east coast but i i look for her paintings and um you you will not see them hung very um prominently on the east coast and too bad for them because they're missing yeah. out on one of one of the great 20th century artists i'd say so Jeanette, always fun doing these programs with you. I look forward to the next one. <laughs> Me too, as always. Um, so the rest of you, uh, get to SF MoMA if you can. It's up on the seventh floor. Don't think you need, it's not a separate ticket to see the Joan Brown. It's included in your admission. Uh, I think there's going to be a, there's some free dates if you look on the SF MoMA website, if that's if you want to save money that way. I think some of the libraries also can get you a free ticket to the museum. So get there, check this out. It's yeah. really, really worthwhile. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Nikki. Who you, Nikki, you have other reasons to want to go to SF MoMA, right? Tell us again who you're excited about seeing. Oh, um, I read in the Sunday paper that Esther Hernandez has uh, something. I'm not sure what is there of hers, but she's a profound San Francisco, um, not a native, but she's been in San Francisco for a long time. And probably the most famous artwork of hers is this that I turned into a pillow. I don't know if you can see it or not. Oh, nice. <laughs> this yeah. is famous. This oh, now yeah. sits in the Smithsonian and 
you know, we take our old t-shirts, we turn them into pillows because we get more visibility that way. I'm so mad. that's one of hers. And um, I'm not sure what else is, is coming, but I'm looking forward to seeing this as well. So uh, thank you, Jeanette. That was really interesting and fun. Fun. Her stuff is so fun. And I could tell so from the comments here that everybody seemed to, really, it's very lighthearted. And the comments were were nice and, and lighthearted. So this was very enjoyable today. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. And Rodney's newsletter is great. I sent the newsletter to a friend of mine who lives here, but he's in New York right now. So he would go look at the, um, what was it, the train, the new train? Oh, the Moynihan Train Hall in uh, right next to the horrible Penn Station is a brand new, beautiful train station. Yeah, I told them about it. I go, you got to go see this. So so your word gets gets around from coast to coast. So thank you for sharing so much, Rodney. Yeah. So we'll see you all uh, in two weeks on the 13th, right? That's a little bit. Yep. We'll be back in two weeks. Yeah. And don't forget that Richie's changed to Friday nights. Okay. Actually, I think it's three weeks just because of the, uh, right? Because today's the- Yeah, the, thir the 13th is when we will meet. February 13th, we'll be back. Um, until then, everyone um, enjoy your art experiences.